I want to talk today about the concept of civic entrepreneurship. And what I mean by civic entrepreneurship is the application of entrepreneurial thinking to city building and civic issues. I want to tell you a story, or two stories, one about a, girl, a woman named Haban and the other about a man named David. Now, David and Haban only met maybe twice in their lives, but they're forever intertwined by the spirit of entrepreneurship. Back in 2008, I was working for an organization then called the Toronto City Summit Alliance. It's since changed to the name Civic Action. At that point, Civic Action had built up a track record of developing some very powerful initiatives in collaboration with other organizations, initiatives that have changed people's lives. But by 2008, we were embarking on a new agenda. We were looking at issues related to diversity and leadership. And I was asked to create a leadership program that would focus on imparting the values around civic entrepreneurship to younger, emerging, rising leaders. By 2009, myself and my colleagues launched the program Diversity Fellows. And it was through this program that I came to meet Haban. She came in for the interview, and I have to say, when I saw her, my biases went up. I admit, I'm guilty. I looked at her and I thought, she's way younger than I was expecting, and way younger than I think, she, than I think someone should be for this program. But as soon as she opened her mouth and started talking, all of those doubts went out the window. She began to tell us about her experiences growing up at Finch and Islington, and then going off to pursue post-secondary education. And by the time she completed her studies, she realized that her mind was completely opened anew to opportunities that she could have never imagined. When she came back to her community, she launched her own initiative called WINK, What I Now Know, in an effort to share with others the things that she had learned through her experiences and perhaps to give her friends and colleagues a head start. So when she came into the interview, told us about Wink and told us about her aspirations to become more active in the city, we were blown away. In a word, her interview was brilliant, and she became one of the 27 fellows chosen for the inaugural year. One of the, pro one of the aspects of the program was to develop your own project, and so Haban and three other people launched what was called Local Democracy Week at Queen's Park. Over 100 young people came to Queen's Park and speed dated with members of provincial parliament, if you can imagine this. And certainly not with the intention of finding a date, but rather with the intention of understanding better how government works and how they could work better with government. So through this project and through her presence in the program, Haban really began to get the attention of different people in the program. So when she revealed her aspiration to become an urban planner, two people took notice, Jamil and Craig. Now these were two other fellows, and Jamil was working at one of the top urban planning firms in the city. Craig was pursuing his master's in urban planning. By the time Craig finished his urban planning master's degree, Jamil had been encouraging him to apply at his firm, which he did, and his charm and intellect paid off. He was accepted at the firm. Only a year later, Herban finished her degree, and you can guess where she ended up also at the firm. And here you start to see the ripple effect of the civic entrepreneurship. But how did it all start? Back in 2002, and this is, now we're getting to the story of David. Back in 2002, David Pico made a, a speech to about 150 leaders in the city. Leaders in business, in labor, in nonprofits, et cetera, et cetera. And he spoke about the usual things, transportation, regional economic development, but there was something different in the way he approached the presentation. He talked to the people in the room as though they could do something about these issues, as though they could be working with government to make a difference on these intractable problems. The people in the room took him up on it, and together they formed the Toronto City Summit Alliance, now known as Civic Action. When I joined a few years later, I was struck by the way David would think about problems and the way that whenever he met someone, he would consider them a potential collaborator. So when we would have a meeting with a, a member of the media, he would say, she's a potential collaborator. We had a, a, a group of young nurses come to our, our office one day and he said, 
their potential collaborators. He viewed every, every person, every organization in this way. And he, and he thought that if you had a really good idea and could bring a really diverse group of people around that idea, that financial and other resources would follow. And his theory proved true time and time again to the tune of over 12 different projects, collaborations with over 10,000 people, and initiatives that have impacted over a million people in the city. Sadly, in 2009, David passed away. It was only nine months after he met Haban and that first group of diversity fellows. Now, David's story and Haban's story are not so unique. There are many people living, the civic entrepreneur, living with a civic entrepreneurial approach in this city and in cities all over the globe. But what would it take for us to really create a culture of civic entrepreneurship in our city? I think there are a few things. We would have to shift our mindset from being consumers of government services to being potential collaborators with government. In the same way that David saw every person as a potential collaborator, we need to look at each other in that way. We also need to have our institutions act as investors, investors in our leadership. If we take the example of Haban, being in that diversity fellows program allowed her to practice being a leader. You hear the expression often that leaders aren't born, they're made, but leaders also need practice. They need places where they can actually take chances, embrace risk, knowing that they will be supported. Schools, faith institutions, think tanks, foundations, they can all be investors of this kind. Finally, my favorite, individuals need to act as shoulder tappers. What I mean by this is, when we see leadership potential, we need to invite people to practice that leadership. We can't allow people to pass us by and not embrace them and not encourage them to act on the talent and the potential that, that they have within them. And even if they don't take you up on it in that moment, they'll remember that invitation and when the circumstances are right and when the time is right, they will. And our cities and that individual will be better for it. So my point today is that this spirit of civic entrepreneurship adds value but it doesn't add value to those people who are, doesn't only add value to those people who are part of it, but it adds value in exponential amounts in ways that affect our city. So in the spirit of civic entrepreneurship and collaboration, I'd like you to collaborate with me on this last slide. These were the words, these were David's last words to our city as they were printed in all of our major newspapers. I'd love you, I would love it if you would read them with me. We can be a city where collective leadership is the norm, a city where civic entrepreneurs are everywhere, and the process of bringing all the parts of civil society together to solve a problem is really how the city defines its uniqueness, a city where this quality is the essence of what makes Toronto so special. Thank you.